Hi, and welcome to another of the Bendigo Writers Festival's Backstory Series. Today, we are going to be speaking with Rebecca prince Ruiz, who is the co-author of what I believe to be one of the most important books published in 2020, Plastic Free, the inspiring story of a global environmental movement and why it matters. And Rebecca's co-author is Joanna Atherfold Finn. It's another great title by New South Books. So Rebecca, two um, sayings really come to mind when I when I think of, of your book and I want to use them to kick off our chat today. Be the change you want to see, um, Mahatma Gandhi's great saying, uh, and from little things big things grow. I think what really makes this book apart from a such a fantastic topic going um, plastic free is the idea that this book is woven throughout not only uh, with your narrative of uh, discovering um, the importance of being um, single-use plastic free but also your story and other people's stories of the movement and how it's grown. So I wonder whether you can um, kick us off and, and tell us, for those who think that July is just about dry July, uh, for those who haven't heard that July is also plastic free July, can you tell us where it all started? Yeah, so plastic free July started here in Perth back in 2011 and it started it was a personal challenge. I didn't set out to start a movement. I didn't really set out to change anything else but myself um, and what it went into um, my own household bin. And I was working in local government at the time and I had the opportunity to visit a recycling facility. And for the first time, I was really confronted by my household waste. So that's where each fortnight when I put my bin out on the curb, and the council collected it, it's where those, those the recycled contents went to be sorted. It's not exactly a recycling facility, it's more a sorting facility into paper, plastic and metal and glass and then bailed up and um, shipped to wherever it was going to be recycled. And I knew what my waste looked like from putting it out in the bin, but I didn't know what mine looked like with my neighbours and everyone in my street and my suburb. And seeing that enormous volume and starting to understand the complexities of recycling really challenged my thinking. And I went home that night and went to put out my recycling and I could picture where it was gonna go. And I'd always felt like, if I filled my recycling bin each fortnight, I was helping the planet. It was kind of like the aim was to fill that bin. And I suddenly realized that whilst of course recycling is important, the less I put in there, the more I could reduce, the more the different choices that I could make, the more I could refuse, the more impact I was gonna have. Um, so for me, it was a deeply personal decision. Um, uh, I can't say it was actually consultative because I don't actually <laughs> remember asking my, my family. So I went to work the next day and I said to my two colleagues, Amy and Abila, I'm going plastic free next month. Who wants to join me? And it, it's kind of a misnomer because we, it, it's not about being perfect. I'm still not plastic free. It was really just about looking for ways to reduce single use plastic in our own lives and look, to be honest, like if I'd had this genius idea in 2019, I would have been one of many. But at that time, it wasn't the same topic of conversation that it is now. Um, the plastic pollution problem wasn't, wasn't really um, on people's radar. There wasn't all those documentaries, The Blue Planet 2. Um, it was a hard concept to kind of get across, but um together 40 of us with our my two colleagues and our volunteers we started to make some changes and i think it's really grown because of the the fact that making those changes felt good and empowering but it also helped to fundamentally align our shared values and concerns about living in a clean environment, being less wasteful with our actions. And it gave us a way to do, the, to do it. And, and I think that, that, 
that quote by Gandhi is, is so true and it's so powerful because if we'd set out to try and change other people, we'd set out to start an education campaign, I do not think it, we would have had the success that we have had now. And that comes through so strongly in the book because, and I, I think it's partly, um, and, and you're going to talk about this throughout our chat, but Joanna's input, because the narrative, um, you know, you could so easily look at that book and think, oh, it's going to be a big, long lesson on, and lecture on how awful I am and how I've got to stop using plastic and it's going to be so difficult. Whereas for me, what jumps out, uh, one of the most important things that jumps out of the, the narrative stories, but also that sense of community and people saying, I want buy-in. This is a, a simple thing I can do um, in my in my own area. So um, I want to come back and, and talk about that, but I've been absolutely fascinated um, just um, reading in the book the different communities that have, that have come on board. But we, before we talk about that, um, I just wanted to ask you first, uh, as you say, you, you started at, at a time when it, perhaps it was starting to come um, onto our radars. And I know um, uh, for me and, and for my family who were quite young at the time, one of the, the most um, startling, horrific things was when we started to see evidence of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, and I wonder um, if you could tell us a little bit about that and also your experience of um, the North Atlantic gyre. Yeah, so the, the Great Pacific, I think a lot of things that, that, that there was a lot of momentum which built around the same time and um, the Great Pacific garbage patch, which is somewhat of a misnomer, um, was first captured the, the media attention. Well, the term was actually coined by the media rather than the Captain Charles Moore, who was the, the, um, the sea sailor that first started talking about this. And so in the ocean, in the world's oceans, there's five major gyres, one of which is the North Pacific gyre. And they're basically large ocean currents. And as they circulate, they tend to concentrate um, any of the plastics that are in the oceans and so the the great pacific garbage patch as it has become known in the in the um north pacific gyre is the gyre that has the most concentrated um plastics uh, ocean plastic pollution in in the world and it um i think it was that concept and we heard about this island that was the, the, the size of Texas floating out in the ocean of garbage that really kind of captured the public imagination. In truth it's not exactly an island, there are certainly hot spots in that, in that patch and I have interviewed um, a scientist, Julia Ressa, in the book who was, um, has um, been part of a research expedition there and sailed across it and flew over that ocean and it's not uh, there's certainly, there are rafts of very big items, which a lot of this fishing gear. Um, but the, what I learned through these interviews and this research I've been doing in sailing across the North Atlantic gyre was that it's, it's not really an island. Whilst you get these hotspots, what it actually is out there in our oceans which is actually more scary is, is more like a soup. So, you know, we've, I think we've all grown up uh, thinking and understanding that, you know, when stuff is in the environment, it breaks down. And whereas that is certainly true for organic material, if you throw an apple core into a bush in the garden or you're thinking of your compost or leaf litter in a forest, it, it does break down, it composts and the soil microbes in the world, worms break that down into smaller and smaller pieces and that is returned to the soil. Whereas the thing that happens with plastic is that it breaks up. So as it's degraded by UV, by wind and wave action, um, it is broken up into smaller and smaller pieces. So when that plastic ends up in the ocean, as it breaks up into smaller pieces, then it can become 
um, more easily ingested by wildlife. And I think, um, and we did talk quite a bit about that in the book, and I think why that's important if, is if we think if it's an island the size of Texas, well, to solve the problem, we go clean it up. You know, that's what we've been taught to do since we were kids. You make a mess, you clean it up. But it's we now know it's not that easy, especially once it gets out into the ocean because it is so widely dispersed and broken up into such such small pieces. And when I was sailing on that boat across the North Atlantic, when we left the coast of England and then as we sailed into the Azores of Portugal, when we were close to land, we did see more items, some fishing gear, we saw plastic bottles, etc. But out in the open ocean, in that middle of that gyre, it was really clean. And I kept thinking, where's this floating island? But then when we put out our, our nets each day and we were towing them along the surface for 20 minutes, and um, they had a big sieve attached out the back end of these, these manta toes. We'd bring them up onto shore and every single lift that we did contained these tiny little fab fragments of plastic of the bags, of pieces of rope, of barcodes, even um, tiny little kind of pearl size, what they call myrtles, which is the pre-production um, plastic. It's a raw material you can make plastic and then they'll make that into a bucket or a container or a kayak. So it's, I felt like it was an important thing because so many people now know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch to kind of talk about that and talk about the, the problem versus the reality. And I also think it's really important to understand here in Australia. So when we look at the Indian Ocean or the South Pacific, our plastic concentrations are very low in comparison to the North Pacific. Um, but when scientists look at where seabirds are most at risk from ocean plastics, it is actually the Southern Ocean boundary and the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand, simply because that's where we have high seabird nesting densities. So although, yes, we are relatively clean here in Australia, um, because we have such abundant wildlife, um, our, our wildlife is, is at risk. And that plastic that's out in the Tasman Sea, it's coming from Brisbane, it's coming from Sydney, it's not coming from Southeast Asia. So we really have responsibility here to be part of the solution. Yeah, and I, I was interested, um, the New Plastics Economy, um, an article or a piece of work that was written by the World Economic Forum and um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, has predicted that in by 2050, plastic waste will outweigh the weight of fish in the ocean. That's, that's scary for me. I'm hoping to still be around in 2050, um, but really scary for the crop of children coming through schools now? Yeah, it is a really scary, um, it's a scary statistic. And I think when that, um, that prediction was released, it really got a lot of attention um, and has really galvanized a lot of effort around this, around this issue. And for me at a personal level, I guess, you know, when I think about the, all of those numbers of, you know, of, of only 9% of plastics we've ever, um, ever produced being recycled, the amount going into our oceans, it's really overwhelming. But at a personal level, I just think, well, every piece that I can refuse is one less piece that could, despite our great waste management systems and and litter programs here in this country. That's just one less piece that could end up in the ocean. So I think that, you know, everything that we do does, that does add up to make a difference. Mm, mm, it does. Um, so one of the things that's um, I, I've found fascinating reading is the way that social media has played such a huge part in Plastic Free July. Um, and you were lucky enough um, to work very closely with someone who's a, a, a real um, media influencer in a way. Um, and one of the things that came through was you realised very early on that one size doesn't fit all. 
it, you really needed to take into account people's personal needs and situations. So I, I imagine to stop the sort of um, um, ecology fatigue that sometimes people can feel when they think, oh, you know, I don't even know where to start. Um, can, can you tell us about um, the part that social media has played? Yeah, look, I think social media has play, played a very big part in the campaign in spreading it. And because we've always, like, of course, we're very motivated and driven by the problem, but we've just focused on the solutions and our social media has always been um, very organic and very real. Uh, I remember one of our, the, you know, early photos that I posted, somebody said, um, what do you do about lining your bin if you're not using plastic bags? And I just whipped out, I think it was an iPhone 3 at the time, I just whipped out the um, our bin. It, you know, wasn't from under the kitchen sink and we'd, by reducing our, our packaging and um, starting to compost our food scraps, we'd reduced our waste a lot. Um, we didn't have any wet kind of smelly stuff in there because we had a compost and a worm bum. So I just took a quick photo of this um, bin lined with the local community newspaper. And within an hour, all of a sudden, 3,000 people had seen it. A lot of people had commented on it. Um, people were really engaged with it and sharing it. And it wasn't perfect. And I think so much of what we see in social media and, you know, I think that the plastic free and zero waste movement has got to take some responsibility here. It's about perfection or it could be, you know, being able to fit your year's worth of landfill waste in a jar, um, which is great. I'm certainly not at that level, but it was like, well, you know, here, this is what I've ma I've managed to do, and then somebody else will share. Well, I've done this, and by sharing those stories and sharing different people's ideas, and I, I just love our social media channels because it is positive. And somebody will ask a question, and before I can get to it, because we'd really need a team of twenty to be able to engage and answer everyone's questions, someone else will have answered that or I live in that city and this is where I found milk without um, that's plastic free etc so it's it's a very generous and sharing community and it's really been like I I never had all the answers and but by and this is what we learned really very very early on in that first year we didn't start using social media till the second year but we found that by sharing people's ideas together, we had lots of the solutions. So that's always really been our kind of, our operating model for Plastic Free July is doing stuff together. And it's been really collaborative. And, you know, to be honest, I think people are just tired about hearing about the problems. If I you know, I don't want to watch another documentary about plastic pollution. It's just so depressing. Or, you know, see another image of a turtle and a whale um, or a seabird with their stomach filled with plastic. Like, I, I know what the problem is. What I want to see is, is solutions and know what I can do. And I think, I don't think that that could have come anywhere else but from community and grassroots change. And the examples you use, I mean, they, when I say them aloud, they sound so obvious, but I, they just really jumped out at me as I was reading. Uh, the idea that zoos have really jumped on board. Um, so Taronga Zoo, had, well, obviously this year, not such an issue for them, but um, the idea of going plastic free in July. It, great stories about, about the zoos. Can you share some of those with us? Yeah, so there's been really lovely stories about zoos getting involved. Zoos and aquariums in, I think originally it was more aquariums than zoos. So right from the start, they've championed it. I remember that, I um, can't quite remember the name of it, but the aquarium in um, Vancouver in British Columbia was one of the early adopters. I think because they have, and it's not just our marine mammals and our marine wildlife, but um, you know, this, the plastics affect um, all animals, you know, they can't discriminate against what's natural and what's not. So 
you know, people who are working in zoos and aquariums, they've got a love of wildlife. Um, regardless of, you know, there, obviously there are some contentious issues around zoos and aquariums, but apart from that, like they can, they, people who work there, they love wildlife. They just, oftentimes they're, they're taking in sick and injured animals. So they have pretty much, you know, every zoo I've spoken to has dealt with animals that have been impacted by single use plastic. So they're making the connection. They're also having conversations with the public every single day uh, about wildlife and so they have really come on board seeing it as an opportunity to raise awareness with the public they're doing it themselves personally which is great as a, as, a, as staff um, but then they've also had to look at well what are the plastics they're using in their organizations so I loved um, seeing stories of um, zoos like Taronga, I know Auckland Zoo got rid of plastic water bottles and they put a whole lot of bubblers um, and water fountains around their, um, around their um, sites and encouraging the public to bring their own or buy one of the zoo's branded ones. So it's really, there's kind of so many opportunities and ways for them to engage. Um, July in both hemispheres is kind of holiday month, so they tend to get a lot, of, a lot of families and children coming through. So yeah, it's really taken off. And then we've had, you know, big agencies like the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, that's actually based out of Spain, have taken it on. There's a big not-for-profit in, in Oregon that, that has been running a Zoos and Aquariums Challenge for Plastic Free July. So it, gives them something really practical and tangible to do yeah. on an issue they're concerned about. And I wonder too whether it links, uh, the, I love the stories um, that you told about Rottnest Island going straw free. And um, I know when our family visited Rottnest Island, we loved it. And, and if there had been that added layer of, wow, Rottnest Island has no straws, you know, you won't find a straw there pretty much. Uh, it adds that extra layer of, I've had the experience, it triggers my memory when I'm, you know, offered a straw or come into contact with a straw. And it, it builds up those layers of, yeah, you know, one single thing, one less piece of plastic that I have accepted or asked for really will in the long run make a difference. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Sarah. And I think, it not only builds up layers in that way, but it also builds up layers of experience. So if you're a child in the family, maybe you've heard something at school um, or you've learned something about the wildlife and then you go on holiday to Rottnest and you might see the sign or you might, you know, ask for a drink and see that it's got no straw or be asked if you want a paper straw or you're happy to go without and then you know the parents might be have seen plastic free july operating in their workplace or seen something on social media so i think we also have these layers of touch points as well and i think that one of the reasons i really love seeing it in zoos and aquariums or i'm um, seeing corporates taking this on or um you know crown resorts doing going straw free for plastic free july is we start to get this kind of social norm so um rottnest island is some is, is the holiday island off Fremantle where i live when you go there they've been plastic bag free for a number of years and you also can't take your car you've got to ride your bike everywhere so it's this kind of it's this having these opportunities, whether it's for the month or plastic free July, or you go on holiday to somewhere like Rottnest, or you go to a restaurant at Crown without a straw, having these experiences that are very normal experience and realizing, oh, there wasn't plastic there, it I think it actually also starts to, I think that leadership is important and it starts to create this social norm and a social license that um well we don't actually all need this the, the, this unnecessary plastic and there is another way and i think 
businesses and organisations really influence what others do in that space. Yeah, so for instance, the, um, the example you gave of Jack Johnson at a, a music festival, um, you know, which young people well, and older people too, absolutely adore. And, you know, one of the things most festivals are held in summer when, especially in Australia, it's hot and dusty and dry, and the temptation to take single-use plastic bottles of water, and he just held up his stainless steel container and you think yeah that you know I, I, I'm well and truly not um, plastic free by any means but but one of the things that you know the catch cries in our family now is oh have you all got your water bottles when we go somewhere and I think wow what a change in in just in 10 years and it's such a simple thing that people can do what was the response um, when he posted that on social media oh, you mean my personal response <laughs> or both <laughs> I was pretty happy. Um, <laughs> yeah, but we had great response. And I think that, um, so that was a concert a couple of years ago at the Santa Barbara Bowl. And uh, for that concert, Jack, so Jack has done, uh, he's you know, a great champion of being a personal, um, making personal changes for the plastic pollution problem. So he's a surfer, he's seen it out there in the ocean. Um, he set up the Kukua Hawaii Foundation to, to start to tackle this. And, but it very much walks the talk. So this tour, uh, this concert in Santa Barbara was in July, so to celebrate Plastic Free July, he gave each of the um, concert goers a stainless steel pint cup and so they could use it. But he not only did that and everyone in the crowd held up their, their stainless steel pint cup, but he worked with the, or his company and his group and foundation worked with that venue, worked with all the venues um, that he was touring to change their practices to make sure that people could bring their own cups to those events to make sure that they're accepted by the vendors and that there were refill stations and so as an as a person of as a celebrity and somebody with influence he was not only influencing behavior change but he was also using his his um, position to start to work within the industry to set a new benchmark. And last year, I, I was delighted to actually, I wasn't to go to a Jack Johnson concert, um, to go to a concert at Santa Barbara at the bowl. And when I was queuing for the toilet, I was queuing behind a couple of women who were holding those very same cups and they were quite dented. And I asked them about, that and they would still take them, you know, several years on, they were still taking them to every single concert. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, you know, people often think, well, what difference can one person make? What's the difference, the change that I can make? But I've seen so many stories like this over the years where that, you know, that change that one person has made can lead eventually to changes in business, to changes in government and changes in the system. So, it re and it really adds up. Mm. And and I, I find it such a hope giving book because it's really all about, as you say, um, you know, the little changes we can make. So for me, I was thinking, well, what can I do in plastic free July that is going to be a lasting change? And I was horrified. I'm a massive tea drinker. Um, and I was horrified when I found out about the microplastics in tea bags. So my commitment has been to make um, tea from loose leaf tea. Uh, and, it, you know, at first you think, oh, it's going to be, you know, a real pain. And but but it's such a simple thing to be able to do and the people that have come into my home this month you know they've said oh what are you doing there and i'm i'm able to say it so it's just one really simple thing um that that somebody can do to make a difference you've got a whole list of um fabulous ideas and i wondered whether we could um talk about it so that people feel right well we we don't just have to do it in july this is something that we can 
take on one thing at a time and take us out through the other months of the year. Um, so you, you have a fantastic list of uh, popular ideas for plastic free living. And I wondered whether you, we could dip in and out of that uh, and, and, and you could talk us through some of those ideas. Yeah, sure. Um, so this, this list of, we put in, oh, there's, there's tips and ideas throughout the book, but this particular list was really, you know, funnily enough, Sarah, it actually came from, as we were, Joanna and I were writing the book, you know, she kept giving me questions and, and the tea bag thing was a big eye opener for her, but so did our publisher, Elspeth Menzies from, from New South. So it was actually her idea because as we were writing and, and she was taking part in Plastic Free July last year, she kept asking me questions all the time. So it, the, the book kind of grew in response to the, the people are around me. So, and, and like you said, like this is a journey, it's not about perfection. And we've always, rather than blaming and shaming or saying, don't do this, don't do that, you've got to go plastic free, like here's some ideas here's some things that have worked for us and people can choose something that works for them or something that they can do because so for example where i live now there's lots of bulk food stores i'm spoiled for choice but there is that's certainly not the case everywhere in australia so the the first idea that we put there was choose loose products so that's when we're buying fruit and veggies try and avoid the little plastic bags put items in reusable netting produce bags or keep them loose. And we wrote this last year, but this is certainly still valid in the times of, of COVID. There's no evidence to say you can catch this virus through ingestion. Um, the CSIRO just advises people to uh, wash your hands before you're preparing fruit and veg and just give things a rinse um, in fresh water and that's exactly the same advice whether there's a pandemic or not so that's a that's a kind of a key one to get started with and for me that's what I first started with as well and then look for bulk food options near you again not everywhere has that but there's a great website um, called zero waste home and they've got a bulk finder option in there and you can not only search for places in your area that sell things in bulk but also um, you can add uh, stores as well if they're not not in there and Joanna and I actually did that when we were writing the book the next one is around like getting rid of plastic cling film I still have my original role of cling film I've told my three children it's their inheritance <laughs> so we've suggested as alternatives to use reusable containers, uh, cover bowls with wax wraps, or just cover it with a plate to store food in a fridge. One of my other personal favorites is switching from liquid soap to bar soap. Again, absolutely fine to use uh, during the pandemic. There's no evidence that, um, that liquid soap is more efficient. Um, bar soap works just as well. You just, it's just a matter of lathering up well and doing it for the right amount of time. Uh, we can buy that from the supermarket. Um, we don't need to go to special shops for that. Uh, one of my other favourites is, is in terms of food storage or, or leftovers. It can be frozen in glass jars. We don't have to go out and buy new containers. You just got to make sure you leave a good headspace, lead a good cuddle, a couple of centimetres um, so if I, I make soup for dinner, I'll usually make a double batch and then freeze in glass jars. So it's just the right size for taking to work to have lunch. Um, just make sure it's cool before you put it in the fridge. And if you're at all worried, don't put the um, lid on until it's frozen because the liquid will expand. And then our final tip was just check out the Plastic Free July website. Sign up for the challenge, the best day to take plastic free July is always today, no matter what time of year, and there's lots of information there. So we tried to make the book, Sarah, I guess, as, as well as being a story of how people have made change, but to give practical ideas and examples of what people can do. Yeah, and I, I, 
the, the few things jumped out at me um, as a result of that. I really, um, it started me thinking, you, you make a, a point about the health benefits that, that follow on. So the idea that um, if we're cooking from scratch, we're not only, you know, if we're buying our, our food in, in bulk, uh, we're not only avoiding all that little plastic packaging, but chances are we're avoiding a whole lot of extra calories and additives that we don't really need in our lives anyway. Um, it, it's what our grandparents knew, what my parents knew, they're pretty old now. Um, and it's, it's sort of become new fashion thinking in a way. Yeah, that's um, certainly true. And one of the really interesting, um, one of the most interesting feedbacks that we get after Plastic Free Time, and this happens every year, is people saying they feel much healthier from doing it, that they've lost weight. And interestingly, even though some things might be more expensive, that they've saved money. And I think it's because as we make this shift to reducing our plastic waste, we're not buying that heavily processed, preserved, packaged foods, often got lots of preservatives, lots of food miles. We, we automatically switch to eating more whole foods, more buying fresh local produce, supporting local farmers, perhaps learning to make some things from scratch, buying what's in season. Mm. And so, you know, a healthier diet certainly does come from, from that. Um, we did a great um, uh, workshop yesterday with a whole food chef in Perth called Jude Blarow, and she's written a number of cookbooks that, that, that I've been using for a few years. And you're exactly right, I think what I've, one of the big things I've learned is is how to make some really simple things from scratch, whether it's to, you know, to buy instead of using a tin, which I later learned is lined with plastic mm -hmm. of chickpeas of just how to soak and prepare my own and how actually how easy that is. And it is starting to learn some of those skills that have been forgotten as I think we've been disconnected from our food and our food systems and how it's grown. And we've kind of gone into this autopilot of grabbing food that's just convenient and packaged in plastic. And it's often more than what we need. You know, one of the stats that really horrified me when we were researching the book is that 40% of all food that we grow in this country is goes to waste. And a lot of that happens in the home. So the, the more we can, that we can do to start to change that, the more money we're going to save as well as the more plastic packaging we're going to be able to avoid. Um, and, and importantly at this time, I think, you know, the more we're supporting local growers and local farmers as well. Yeah. And I was also just thinking of um, the concept of, you know, reaching for a biscuit. And these days, my... Um, um, parents are in there, well, mum's not with us, but dad's in his 90s, and they always used to tell us stories of, um, dad said that the milk bar, uh, you went down and you either got your half pound or whatever of biscuits, um, and it came in a, um, a paper bag, and if you wanted to save money, you got broken biscuits, so, you know, they still taste the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, mum always talked about um, these big tins of, of biscuits and flour and things that they got, and you know, because it was before plastic was used. And I was just thinking, my son this morning was baking biscuits. Uh, and I thought, well, think of all the plastic that the whole, you know, he's baked them for the whole family. And, but, but as much as anything, watching the hours that took him, to make them, it, it would, well, it made us all realise, wow, if that much effort goes into just eating one biscuit, maybe we don't just need to open packets and pop them in our mouths all the time. It, it, it's that whole thing, as you say, of connecting us to food, connecting us to um, community, connecting us to time and helping us to be uh, more mindful. Uh, and I wonder whether plastic has sort of become almost like a, um, a byword for that disconnectedness uh, to our planet, to our communities, to ourselves. Yeah, I think it has. I think plastic is, is 
is has become is the symbol of the throwaway society that we have come become and we talk about this in the book of this is really the first moment in our history where we have taken resources used them once and thrown away we have never before wasted 40 percent of our food we used to use everything um and so i think you know on the surface whilst plastic for each line what we're talking about in the book is just that single use plastic and the waste issue but underneath it is it is symbolic and has come to represent so many other things of which we've lost and that the joy that people get from doing plastic free July is so much more than what they um, are no longer putting in their bins it's all those other benefits it's the fact they feel more connected with their communities um, interestingly we did some research uh, we did a lot of research on the impact of plastic free July in terms of behavior change and waste avoidance and one of the interesting statistics we found out last year is there was a nine percent increase in people's well-being through mm. participating in the challenge so mm. yeah there's a, um there's a lot going on beneath the surface yeah well you the wonderful story you tell of the um plastic free picnic in san francisco it kept, the, that just, to me, really summed up what the book's about, that it's not a heavy stick saying, don't do this, don't do that. If you do without, you know, it, you'll have terrible feelings of withdrawal and, and you know, desperation. But, but the, the idea that it's so positive and constructive, I just thought it was such a beautiful story. Yeah, I love the story of that picnic. Um, it happened, it was last July in San Francisco. And... To me, it's it's a lovely plastic creature life story because it is a story of a solution. It's a story of people that came together. Some people had met before, some people hadn't. They put it out on a local meetup group. Um, some people were doing plastic for each lie, others just heard about this event and everyone brought along something to share. Um, I had those knitting bags with me and we just went to the farmer's market and we bought some, um, just some beautiful fruit and a local cheese, I think, and some bread. And um, what was so lovely about it was that I can now go like any place I've gone in the world, I just reach out to someone who signed up to do Plastic Free July as a community organiser and say, I'm coming to town, I'd love to meet, have a cup of tea. And so I get to meet people from everywhere of every, um, from so many different cultures and communities and they're all just like me. They just want to do the right thing. They're concerned about this issue and I feel like I have this instant community um, wherever I go. And that's something I've really learned over the last 10 years. And, and our one of the things that our research has shown is that um, in, in, when we do surveys of the general public, you say eight out of 10 people will say they're concerned about plastic waste ending up in the oceans and ending up in, in landfill. And at first, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that because you think, well, that can't be right because eight out of 10 people aren't refusing single use plastic. But the fact is, everyone wants to live in a clean environment. No one's okay with seeing those images of our wildlife devastated by, by plastic. But we have this disconnect between our values and our attitudes and our behaviors. So organize a picnic, organize a plastic free morning tea, organize a workshop to teach people how to make simple food from plastic or make your own beeswax wraps or whatever it is. Organize to do something positive, particularly around food and people want to get involved. And it's really nice to be able to, to do that and share those and celebrate those connections and learn from each other and i think that you know the saying actions speak louder than words is really true and i i think that idea of people really wanting to connect with um you know the uh, we've got lost trades fairs here and um looking at 
things that that are going to last a long time and that you um, inherit something that perhaps someone has made for you instead of um, buying a, something that can be thrown away uh, and you're just using it at, you're using it once um, you also talk about um, the um, the issue of really thinking about, but in a positive way, not in a shaming way, thinking about where plastic is in our lives. And I wondered if you could step us from a kitchen sink, any old kitchen sink, past a, a bench in a kitchen, to your fridge. Can you think of two or three things or ways that we could eliminate that, especially the single use plastics? Yeah, so um, if I think about starting at the starting at the sink, I think I guess immediately of the washing the dishes. So um, we've made the switch to using uh, we still use some cotton. We use cotton cloths that can be washable rather than the um, I won't name the brand, but but um, you know the, the disposable ones that are that are made from from plastic. We've got a great um, coconut fibre scrubber to use, um, a dishwashing brush with a replaceable head. And then we um, take our containers of our dishwasher to the um, bulk food store and we get that refilled with detergent. So that's kind of the plastics we've, we've refused there. And one of the things that, so in, in under the bench in, where we have the, the, the first drawer has got all the cutlery in, then the next drawer, that was the glad wrap drawer and the drawer with the, um, the, um, the Ziploc plastic bags for lunches and everything. And so we kind of kept that drawer and then I had my containers and lunch boxes in a far drawer in my kitchen and stuff everywhere. And then when we started doing plastic fridge lines, started reducing our single use plastics, I was like, why does this drawer that I now never open that has the the um, cling wrap in? Why is that still the second, you know, the second drawer, the one of the most convenient ones? So we've now got that in the bottom drawer, and um, and the second drawer is now the reusables drawer, and that's where we keep the lunch boxes, the beeswax wraps, um, some utensils, some little calico bags where we can put the little reusable containers in. Um, and you know, some of it was just putting what we already had into a, a handy place, and then slowly over time, we've, you know, we've as we've replaced items, we've got stainless steel lunch boxes to, so that was replacing that 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 plastic wrap and Ziploc bags, and then in the when I think of the fridge, um. Yeah, the same ideas of how we've stored out our leftovers in reusable containers, store a lot of stuff in, in jars in my freezer. I'll even do things like I keep a, a piece of ginger in a jar in the freezer, really easy to grate. I'll keep, uh, if I've got a bunch of vegetable peelings or the ends of leeks, I'll put that in a jar or a container. And then when I've got enough, make a stock. And I'll, in my fr um, vegetable crispers, instead of storing everything in a plastic bag, it will be, I've got a stainless steel tin with holes in it for my fresh herbs or wrap things in a damp tea towel to, to make them last longer. And yeah, so like I didn't go and get rid of my, all of the plastic that I had, like I kept using what I had, I kept using the plastic containers or the Tupperware, they're the ones I'll take, if I do buy meat or go to the fish monger, I'll take those containers and I'll tear them on the scales and then fill them up. So it was about using what I had, uh, if I needed to replace something, I would tend to replace it with glass or stainless steel, but just slowly making changes and, and looking for alternatives. Some things I learned to do from scratch, I kept doing, um, like making yogurt, but, you know, make things like making pasta. Like that, we actually, we did it on the weekend on Saturday night, but I wouldn't try that on the weekday again. It was too much time and mess. Um, yeah, so it's about making small changes, 
slowly and doing one thing at a time was really important too. Yeah. Um, so just before we um, start to wrap up, I'm really fascinated um, that you, there's so much narrative in a book that, as I said earlier on, could be so dry and so preachy um, and, and didactic. And it's not that at all. And you credit part of that um, for the input that Jo had um, in, in her contribution to the book. So how, how did you both go about writing the book together? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, we had to meet each other because we didn't actually meet until after we'd signed the contract. So the reason I asked Joanna to write with me is I was really clear from the outset. I, I knew this was a great story. I knew there were so many great stories in there, but I wanted somebody to, but I'm so close to this. And as you can tell, I'm so passionate. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted somebody to help me to find that goal, to find the thread. And I was really adamant that this was not a book for the converted or the activist. I mean, of course, I would hope that would be used to them, but I wanted this to appeal to a mainstream audience. And so I read Joanna's book, Watermark, which is a beautifully written collection of short stories that have this, um, that had um, some characters and themes woven through it and I loved the book and her writing and I knew she'd our husbands know each other and I knew she'd taken the Plastic Free July challenge and they've made lots of changes in their family and it was really important to me also to find not only somebody that wrote beautifully and obviously connected with the issue but also wasn't as close to the issue as me because I wanted it somebody to be able to ask those questions to help find that thread of what's going to be of interest to to a really broad audience what what's what and what's the timeless story here because plastic is there is so much um i guess focus on this issue i wanted it to also have a story that wouldn't age because i think in some ways whilst the book is about plastic, there's really a story in here about how, about change making and how individual change and um, can add up and change the system. So yes, yeah, she definitely ticked all the boxes. So we met after we'd um, signed the contract and fortunately we got on very well. So I live in Perth and Joanna lives in Port Stephens in, in New South Wales. So um, I spent, uh, I can't remember how many trips in the end I made to um, go and visit her in her home and stay with her in her home. And sometimes we wrote in her parents' home in the northern beaches of Sydney. And I would just blurt out this last 10 years of the story. I would show her photos, clippings from old emails and newsletters and newspaper articles and tell her stories and then we interviewed people some of them we do together some of them we met um, some of them she would just do over the phone and we just had we've now got a whole folder of outtakes or stories that didn't make it in there but she kind of went to this whole deep dive of the waste issue and started to help find the threads taught me how to write without using exclamation marks. I didn't realise how many exclamation <laughs> marks I used, but she told me I didn't need them. If the, you didn't need them if the message was strong enough. Um, so I learned a lot about the writing process from her. And it was a really, truly collaborative process as we explored the, the story and the issue together. And sometimes, you know, we did a lot of it by phone. She would interview by me and I remember one, one of the chapters in chapter four, I think we, she did a recording as we sat around her kitchen table and the recording failed and we had to do it again. And I ended up, she lives on a big rural block and I find it hard to sit down, whereas Joanna could just sit down and write for eight hours, whereas I'm a doer and a talker. And I ended up just going and walking around her garden and she interviewed me by phone. But it was great. We're really quite different. Um, 
But that's kind of also the story of Plastic Free July. Like I was really clear that I don't have the skills for this. Um, and, and I don't have all of the answers, but I, I could find somebody who did and relying on the people that are out there. And then we kept putting call outs for stories from different things. But for different parts of the books and doing interviews and learning and it was a real co-creation of this book which we fortunately just finished in the first week of March. Well I'm so glad that you had a chance to to work together as I said I, I, I stand by my self-opinionated um, opinion I, I really do think it is one of the most important books that has been published in 2020 and I and and I as I've said before I, I think the narrative the sense of um, community and also the fact that it's such a positive and hope giving book I, I really hope it does well um, and I, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and, and finding out a little bit more about Plastic Free July today Rebecca thanks very much Oh, thank you, Sarah, and thanks for your kind words and for the opportunity, and I'm very glad to, that you have read it. Great.